So I um, you know, struggled a bit trying to figure out what I was going to speak about today. Uh, I've given a few talks on reproducible research, but they've always been um, either to people that haven't just listened to almost two days full of talks or um, you know, had been in the beginning of a set of talks. So I've, uh, let's see. I guess, in some sense, what I'm talking about today is sort of my perspective. Um, I'm going to start with a few stories um, that I find illustrative. Illustrative? Like it's different here and here. So uh, I've got this quote here. I've recently, um, well, I guess I should say also that a lot of what I'm going to be talking about uh, are ideas that I've been um, sort of discussing quite a bit with two of my uh, colleagues, uh, Matthew Brett and Fernando Perez. And uh, in particular, Matthew Brett uh, has introduced me to a bunch of uh, 1950s uh, management theory, um, which he's been very interested in. I think actually has a lot of um, interesting applications to what we're doing. So you, you see this beginning is production. And I think you know, the way I'm thinking about this is, uh, you know, as a scientist, we all want to be more productive. Uh, we want to produce better results. And uh, that's basically what production is in this sense. And uh, this quote by Peter Drucker, um, I think is you know, nice in the sense that uh, a lot of times you think about production as the application of tools to materials. And uh, he points out that it's actually you know, an application of logic to work. And uh, this kind of reminds me of, um, so I, I use uh, Vim as my text editor. And uh, I can't remember the name of the author, but the, the main writer of um, Vim actually suggests that at the end of your work day that you spend about 10, 15 minutes thinking about how you used your text editor and how you can be more efficient. Uh, that may be a little bit extreme, but I do think that um, you know, really what we need to be doing as scientists is constantly thinking about you know, what our practices are, how to improve them, and how to make them more reliable. Uh, and I guess in the other sense is um, I've been kind of wondering a bit during this uh, last few days if uh, reproducible is really the word we want to use. I think it sort of encapsulates a lot. I don't have a better word for it, but um, I think I'm going to try to give a, a slightly different take on it. So uh, more like the factory production line. You know, what, what I want to talk about today is um, you know, how do you make a sort of a process where you know uh, at the end of it, that what you've done is something reliable and repeatable. So that the next day you come in and you can get the same exact thing. Uh, not necessarily that you're going to hand it to someone else and them do it, but um, basically that uh, you can trust what you've done yourself. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, just a few stories that I've been thinking about recently. I've, um, a while ago, uh, PBS had a documentary about the Panama Canal that I watched, and it was really interesting. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, I recommend you do it, um, or watch it if you get a chance, or look into this history. But uh, sort of the story I want to talk from here is, um, you know, earlier the French had tried to do this and they had failed. Uh, basically, there was times they said that um, you know, they would dig out the trench and uh, then the rains would come and it would fill up at least as much as they dug out back into it. Spent you know, several years, I think uh, something like 22,000 people died and then they abandoned it. And um, shortly after that, uh, America is sort of new rising country. Uh, with Roosevelt in office had taken on the ambition of um, actually going through with it. And uh, Roosevelt was famous for having this phrase, make the dirt fly. And so that was the thing. He wanted just to see the dirt you know, coming out. And that's in some sense what the, for the French had done as well. Uh, the first person he had appointed to lead this effort uh, ended up resigning. And um, Roosevelt brought in another man who uh, spent two years. And the first thing he did was um, stop the digging. And uh, he did two other things instead. One was he um, got someone to deal with the mosquito problem that was causing the deaths. And uh, that was an interesting bit of science because that was the first uh, real large-scale application of people. You know, they just recently had figured out the mosquitoes were the vector. And then the other thing he did was um, uh, a bunch of railroad improvements. So this picture here you can see, uh, one of the things they did was they had these railroads where they could actually move up to 12 feet at a time. And so they had these railroads coming out with all the dirt, and then they could uh, dump it out. And when that spot got filled, they'd move it over. And uh, you know, the, sort of the lesson from here is that uh, if you really do want to make the dirt fly, sometimes you have to have you know, a processing stream or an infrastructure in place that you can actually accomplish that. The other thing I wanted to talk about is um, this plant knew me. Uh, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with it. There's a great NPR story on it that you can look up. Uh, this is right outside of Fremont. Uh, and I think from the 60s to the early 80s, it was a, a GM plant. And uh, the United Auto Workers of America had labeled this as the worst um, automobile plant in existence in the US. And so GM closed it. And around, you know, shortly after, they came up with this idea to reopen it with uh, Toyota to sort of learn how to make these small, fuel-efficient cars. And Toyota's first idea was that let's hire everyone back, including the um, uh, union uh, representatives. And they did that. And they actually turned that into one of the 
GM's highest producing uh, plants. So same workers, you know, same sort of facilities, same union representatives, uh, and you know, when I was saying how bad it was, people were drunk on the job, doing drugs. I mean, literally people would, uh, you know, if they got mad with their boss, they would put um, you know, bottle caps in the doors so that when people bought the cars, they'd rattle around and annoy the, the customers. Um, and at the end, they actually had people that you know, would drive by, and if they saw someone with one of their cars, they put a little you know, thing on it you know, with their name and number, asking them to call and, and tell them how they liked it. And uh, essentially, it was just a cultural change. They were, um, uh, one of the main things they did was uh, GM had had this idea that throughput through the pipeline was important. So uh, no matter what, you couldn't stop the, process, or the, you know, the building um, process. And what they would do is at the end, if there was any defects, they would set it aside and they would fix it. Uh, Toyota instead said, if there's any problem at any point, stop the line and don't start it until it's fixed. And uh, you know, basically, people start taking a lot more pride in it. They also start asking the people how to, um, how to make the process better, you know, what they could do to improve things. And so I think there's a really important lesson here, and I, I really encourage anyone to look at the NPR story on this. Uh, there's also uh, another um, uh, guy from the 50s, a management theory guy, Deming. Uh, and in fact, he had, I guess, gotten started. He was a statistician who got started um, thinking about sort of analyzing uh, production lines in the US during World War II. And then uh, America kind of lost interest in that idea, and he went to Japan. So. Um, you know, a lot of the ideas that I think Toyota and stuff built in were based on these things. And part of it's that, um, again, sort of looking at that you know, pipe, you know, the, the factory line, is that um, you know, the idea isn't that you have a process and then you check and validate it at the end, is that you know, what you need to do is build a process that you know will make reliable things. And the validation part is just to make sure that your process isn't faulty, not that the actual products are faulty. And another sort of idea I wanted to um, talk about is uh, this quote from Dijkstra, the, the concept of radical novelties is a contemporary significance because while we are ill-prepared to cope with them, science and technology have now shown themselves expert in inflicting them on us. And uh, this is a, you know excellent, well, actually it's a little weird format, but uh, it's an excellent essay to read as well. Um, and he was sort of arguing that you know, humans have this tendency to try to um, deny that something new is happening and that when they finally are forced to admit something's new happening, they um, try to just simply use the old methods. And uh, you know, I think you know, we've clearly demonstrated you know, we've got this process of science, and um, there's some new stuff going on, and we really haven't dealt with it. And um, you know, I think that's something that you know, bears some thought. So this is the other thing, I guess, going um, sort of my question that I would ask about uh, you know, what I'm interested in, sort of this rubric or what, you know, title of reproducible research, are um, you know, these sort of questions. And you know, what I really want is you know, better, faster, cheaper. So you know, are we doing a good enough job, and, and how would we even know? Um, you know, how long does it take to go from the ideas that you first come up with, maybe in a lab meeting, to actually having a paper? Uh, and you know, all this data collection, you know, what proportion of this data actually makes it to publication? And uh, you know, are we duplicating work that other people have already done? Uh, and are we doing work for other people because they don't know how to do it? Um, and I think that, you know, especially a lot of people here you know, are very computationally savvy. Uh, maybe there's a programming task, and you've worked with some uh, other scientists that aren't. And, uh, you know, we really don't want to be in the position where we're just doing uh, services for them. We want to do real collaborations. And I think we constantly want to ask if there's tasks that can be automated. Um, this is just going back to uh, uh, Francis Bacon, when, you know, sort of the beginning of the scientific experimental method. You know, the top quote that um, I really like to think about a lot is that um, you know, truth is going to come out of error a lot better than it's going to come out of confusion. So we've got to constantly ask ourselves, are we getting bad results because we're confused about what's going on? Or are we just making mistakes? If we're making mistakes, those things can be fixed. If we're confused, we need to stop and figure out what's going on. And uh, you know, he sort of has this idea, you know, the scientific method basically is a sort of guiding force that can uh, allow you to proceed and figure out what the truth is, um, or well, what the answer is maybe. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my sort of current plans, what I'm thinking about now, um, now I got to them. So I, I uh, work in the Neuroimaging Center at, at Berkeley. Uh, basically, there's an MRI. Um, machine and uh, it takes uh, functional images and structural images. Uh, scientists do a bunch of cognitive tasks and then they try to correlate uh, the tasks with the, um, with the signals they're getting and then deduce sort of what brain regions are involved in what kind of tasks. And uh, you know, the interesting thing, I think this is representative of a lot of scientific fields, is that um, you know, the scientists coming in here are uh, backgrounds, maybe psychology, psychiatry. They've not got a lot of computational um, training. They don't have a lot of mathematical training. 
but all of a sudden they sort of are responsible for this domain that you know, requires understanding of MRI physics, that require, you know, requires signal processing, um, image processing, uh, statistical analysis, data management, uh, plus you know, understanding uh, the neuroanatomy and you know, animal models and all kinds of things. Uh, and they're really being asked to do quite a bit. And uh, you know, I think the, sort of the state of the field when I was getting involved with it in early 2000 was that um, you know, since these you know, uh, researchers weren't really trained in a lot of these fields, there was some sense that there was a lot of deep magic going on. And so this phrase I'm taking um, from the, uh, the hackers, uh, what is it, the, it's a good, thank you. Uh, and you know, what the idea is that there's sort of parts of things that um, really require some sort of expert level understanding that you know, it's not mere mortal, um, mere mortals can deal with. And I think that's partly because of uh, you know, the specialization that we've had over the years in science. I think um, actually though it's a large part is um, a lack of patience, both on the people who are experts in these areas as well as the people who need to gain expertise in this area. And um, you know, this sort of ends up with leading to a lack of understanding, and I think a lack of understanding leads to confusion, frustration, and helplessness, which is a really bad place to be in. And I think is uh, you know, part of the problem that uh, re these results are not reproducible because of these reasons. So one of the first things I was involved with, with Matthew Brett and Fernando, was trying to get um, a new sort of analysis software package written for neuroimaging, which is called <laughs> NiPy. And, uh, the idea was that we really wanted to make sure that you know, the code was very clear, people could understand it, and they knew what they were doing. And during this, you know, early on, we um, you know, wrote some grants and got some uh, money from the uh, NIH and hired some programmers to work on this. And uh, during that process, I think you know, it became clear that you know, really the people that need to be doing this are the scientists doing the research. And I think that's probably the case for a lot of domains. Um, you know, it's not really clear what the analysis should be, and the people doing the work are the ones that need to be figuring out the answers to that question. Uh, and you know, recently we've also started thinking a little bit about, um, so for the next year, Matthew and I have decided we're going to um, take the task on of uh, dealing with one of the labs at Berkeley and uh, basically going around and, and interviewing all the researchers and the groups they work in. And uh, this is coming out of the, the management theory books, um, where if you wanted to figure out how to improve a process, you had to go out and find out what's going on. I mean, in Toyota, I think they call, um, it, you know, go find out. So all the managers are um, required in Toyota to spend some time on the, the factory floor. And uh, the idea is we're going to talk to these researchers and try to find out, you know, questions like uh, how many makes, mistakes do you make? Uh, what do these mistakes cost you? And uh, are there mistakes you could have made that you didn't know about? Uh, we also wanted to look into data and code sharing and in a limited context of basically sharing within a lab. So they have access to the same, you know, uh, servers, the same um, uh, computational systems, and try and figure out just, you know, between two colleagues, maybe even in the same cubicle, uh, how quickly could they send an email to one of them and uh, ask them to replicate or, you know, rerun their analysis. And, um, you know, basically, you know, the, the plan for this as well is to really, um, you know, not report to someone else, but give this information back to the researchers and try to work with them to think about, you know, what we can do to, to change this. So uh, I was going to go into a few tools and practices that I recommend. Um, I mean, a lot of these come up before, and I'm just going to emphasize them. So yeah, I say Git for everything. I, it doesn't really have to be Git. Any kind of version control system, I think, is good. But um, when I mean everything, I, you know, my, my slides, my talks, my papers, grants, code, uh, to-do lists, I keep everything in version control. And you know, having this sort of practice, you know, one, I've got one set of tools that I'm using for everything, and I also have this, you know, Ability to keep track of it. yes. Do you have one repository? I've got tons. I've got stuff on GitHub. I've got you know, personal ones. I've got shared ones with other people. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, some of the yeah, you have to have a bunch. I mean, some of them we need different permission levels on. Uh, you know, some people you're collaborating with maybe not don't want to have uh, people accessing things that you're doing. Um, and you know, some of the, my personal stuff. I, I mean, I, I keep a lot of things in Git. Uh, my, uh, my colleague, Matthew Brett, who I was mentioning, he actually uh, does his taxes uh, through a system he set up that's in Git uh, as well. And uh, he had to spend a lot of time on this because he's a, you know, a British uh, citizen who's working in the U.S. and he uh, owns property in England. So it's quite, quite complex what he's doing, but um, you know, he's uh, yeah, just literally almost everything. Is this permission based sort of a deal? Anything you know of that would allow him to find any permissions on sort of file by file level? Like basically, essentially, it's a version control system of 
about like we have right now, except that you could sort of um, when, when this is blacklist on specific items or something. I'm not sure how fine grained you can make it with file by file, but um, there's, 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 there is one. Uh, one Ketosis? system that allows you to uh, put permissions on file level directly. That's pretty good. Which one? I don't remember the Ketosis. I, I can look it up in Google because I don't know if you call the name. They never find it. Alright. Yeah. Get a light. Yeah, I think get a light replace Ketosis maybe. Um, but uh, the other thing I was going to say is you know, we've heard a lot about Python, and I think it's actually um, a really useful tool. I mean, uh, I think in general, knowing some programming language really well is important. Uh, I'm going to recommend Python. And in particular, if you want to get started, there's um, the, uh, what was that, the, the second issue, I can't remember, I guess that's uh, March, April edition of this uh, year's Computing and Science and Engineering was dedicated to scientific computing in Python. And there's a really nice introductory article by um, you know, the lead author is Fernando Perez, uh, talking about the ecosystem for Python and scientific computing. There's also a nice article about NumPy and then this project Cython that um, is really useful that you know, came out of the Sage project originally. And uh, also Myavi, which is a three-dimensional um, sort of Python version built on top of uh, VTK. Isn't there a special issue on Python every couple of years? The last one was 2007. Okay. Yep. And we're going to put out another one, hopefully, in a few years. Actually, uh, there's supposed to be a uh, next year, I need to work on this, but um, there's supposed to be a special issue on uh, scientific computing or mathematical and symbolic computing with Python, uh, some more of SAGE stuff. Uh, you know, also, I think this has been emphasized by a lot of people, but you know, literate programming, I think, is uh, something that, I put it in quotes because I'm not sure exactly the definition, but I mean, the idea that uh, your code and um, your text would be integrated is what I mean by that. And uh, you know, I use Sphinx for a lot of this. Um, if you were here on the tutorial day, you probably got to see some of that. Uh, you know, but if you're using R, I think Sweeve or something else, and it looks like Fortran has something as well. So I think it's, you know, learn a programming language well, you know, preferably R, Python, possibly Fortran. Um, probably you should learn Fortran some anyhow. Uh, and then, you know, sort of some sort of text processing where you can um, integrate that, I think is really useful. So practices. Um, I have a background coming out of the system in world, and um, you know, in this uh, you know, automate thing is just deeply ingrained in me. Uh, you know, don't do anything on a computer unless you can repeat it automatically. Uh, and you know, I think that you know, it's a mistake to think that scientists uh, that aren't trained in this can't be trained in this. I've had um, you know I've hired uh, you know ten plus years Windows system ins who have been taught you know rigorously that you do everything with the GUI, um, never use a command line, and you know when they came to work with me. You know, it was all command line. You know, I have a system in place for my systems that um, you know, automatically uh, monitors each computer, and you programmatically describe how it, you want it in a declarative language, how you want that computer to be configured, and that runs a little daemon that checks to make sure the configuration, and if it's, the machine's not there, it moves it into it. You know, sometimes it's difficult at the beginning. There's some resistance, but uh, you know, I, didn't have, I never had an experience where I showed someone the system, they got to use it, and at the end thought that they preferred uh, using GUIs. Um, and uh, I think a lot of scientists we've had the same experience with, you know, people that you know, had no computational background. You know, we've worked with them, showed them Git, um, you know, showed them best practices in Git. They pick it up, uh, especially you know, you know, early grad students. I think it's the best time. Um, and uh, you know, I think we need to elevate programming as a first-class citizen in general. And uh, you know, that means that you, know, you need to encourage your students uh, to learn how to program, and uh, not just learning you know, the technical syntax of a programming, but I think there's uh, a lot of need in sort of picking up programming articles, best practices, software engineering stuff. Um, uh, I've got the practice of programming, uh, which I recommend highly. There's several other good books. I also think that um, even if you have, you know, like I do, Python as your primary language, it's really useful to spend some time learning other languages, even just cursory. Um, so, you know, for instance, there's a lot of interest now in functional programming, and, you know, just spending a little time looking at something like OCaml, um, or one of the other ones, I think will give you some insight into how to use your primary language in a new way. And uh, I think, you know, sort of going more into the software engineering, here's some uh, methodology from, I guess, the agile uh, world that I think are really useful. Um, you know, I think it's important not to be religious about things, but, uh, you know, taking some of the best ideas and trying to put them into practice is, is a very good idea. So test-driven development, I talked a little bit about on... Um, the tutorial day, 
And you know, the basic idea there is that you start uh, by writing your tests, and then you write the code to, to pass the tests. Uh, pair programming is a really useful thing. Um, you know, sitting down with one of your colleagues and working at you know, one computer with one keyboard and uh, coding, you know, it's, a, it's a much more fun enterprise. You're you know, collaborating with someone, and uh, you tend to write much better code because you know, you've got to constantly think about the person looking at it, um, the other person can correct it, you can work together. One of you can look up information, find answers, suggestions. And uh, metaprogramming is, um, I, mean, I think a lot of people have talked about this here, is you know, writing a program to write programs. So you know, people are really bad at um, doing the kind of work that computers are really good at. And anytime you can offload work to the computer, you should do that. So um, you know, compilers are one example of this, uh, regular expressions. Uh, I think you were mentioning, uh, were you, uh, yeah, well, several talk speakers I think were mentioning uh, having written programs that write programs. Um, uh, how much time do I have? Uh, about 12. No more than 15 minutes. Okay, I'm getting close. So I've just got um, you know, four things I really want to invite you guys to do. Um, uh, programming best practices, there's a, a website, Software Carpentry, and you don't have to use this one, but uh, a lot of these ideas I think are useful. So if you haven't uh, gone through it, it's really useful to just go through it. There's web tutorials. Uh, if you're you know, a faculty, um, you should uh, offer some sort of class. I know. Um, uh, Randy's done that, and uh, is David here still? No, I'll see him. But uh, he, he had also mentioned he had uh, done this. Uh, if you know, you're a grad student or postdoc, you know, try to get a few guys together and go through these courses. Um, they cover things like versioning control, uh, the shell, testing, Python. Um, and I think you know, this is you know, sort of building these practices in and thinking about them are, are really useful. Uh, again, I think um, you know, Python, and particularly I, I'm interested in having people just participate. You know, there's a lot of people doing Python stuff here. There's uh, an annual U.S. sci-fi conference, which uh, is mostly scientists. There's a few people from industry, and uh, people present papers. We have proceedings. There's also an annual Euro sci-fi, and this year we'll have the third uh, sci-fi India. Uh, you know, I think these have tutorials in the beginning with some of the main authors of some of the packages, and uh, it's a chance to present um, you know, your research, but from more of a tool development side, uh, programming side. Uh, and if you have students that are interested in this, it's another place to, um, to encourage them to go. The prices are relatively cheap. Uh, we have typically at least um, 10 slots for grad students um, to come. Uh, you know, your registration and uh, flight and hotel are all paid for. Uh, we had a few people talking about um, you know, data and anonymity. Uh, I recommend you go to this blog, um, 33bits.org. Uh, it's a researcher, um, Aravind, I guess is his name. Uh, he was involved with the Netflix challenge. And uh, you know, I don't know if you know this, but Netflix had this challenge where they de-anonymized all the data. And um, uh, this guy and another guy, I guess his faculty when he was at Texas, uh, figured out who the people were and how to re-identify uh, re them. And uh, you know, the 33 bits, if you read this, uh, it's because um, with 6.6 .6 billion people, you, know, you actually need 32.6 bits of information to identify them. And he points out just knowing um, your hometown that you're in has 100,000 people you know, vastly simplifies that. Uh, and so you know, the consequence of this is that you know, things that we don't really consider personally identifying, now with these computational systems we have, are. Um, and that's going to become more and more the case. And there's lots of researchers working on this. And uh, there's a new journal I wanted to make sure everyone knows about. Uh, open Research Computation. Uh, it's just starting out, and the idea is that you know, this is going to be research code um, uh, discussions, and uh, the code will all have to be made available with an open source license. Uh, we're looking for submissions, and um, uh, Cameron Nealon is the, uh, the chief editor, uh, but I'm on the editorial board. Uh, Victoria's on it, Fernando Perez, um, there's a ton of people, and um, we'd love to see more contributions. So that is basically all I wanted to say, and I'm happy to take questions. Biomet was also the data. data, 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 data. Yeah. 
No. Yes. Yeah, so um, we were talking a lot about just educating people and things like that. Uh, do you see like, um, I was just curious if I wanted to teach a class, for example, and reproducibility research or something mm -hmm. like that. I mean, there's this notion of tools and things like that, but in terms of some of the other things, I mean, have you ever thought about what kind of things we should be teaching beyond Git and, you know, software things? Are there other things really that we should be Telling people yeah. that it would really be helpful. Oh, do you want to hear something? Or? Uh, yeah. Well, I wanted to actually answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I, I taught such a class last semester, so spring at Columbia in the statistics department. And that was the first time that uh, I experimented with this. And what I did is I turned it into, so it was for advanced PhD students. And they chose a paper and uh, replicated the results. So it became a vehicle for teaching these things like version control and shell scripting and things like that that don't have normally a place that would teach them to grants, even though they're absolutely necessary for reproducibility, as well as they run into the problems of reproducibility and all of this. And then I talked about um, some of the cultural uh, aspects and uh, we had discussions about the legal aspects and some of the other things that are just sort of happening in the reproducibility movement. So if you want, I can send you this a little bit. Yeah, I'd be very I've actually been, you know, Matthew Burke and I and a few other people have been talking about um, something similar for neuroimaging. And, uh, you know, one of the ideas we had was, uh, you know, a lot of the neuroimaging software um, courses basically teach you how to click all the buttons and what to do in that sense. And we were thinking, you know, going through the processing and, uh, you know, starting out with, um, you know, opening up an image and looking at it. Uh, and then, you know, the first step is maybe, um, uh, you know, realignment. And then after that, you need to do some um, uh, motion correction. And so the idea would be, you know, we'd uh, start out with, you know, having them implement the, you know, the, the brain dead simplest version of that themselves, and then showing them the sort of production quality. So, you know, you don't teach them necessarily how to do the, you know, most advanced version of things, but, um, you know, at least give them the idea that it's not magic, that they can, you know, do at least a rudimentary version of it, and then, you know, the idea is that it's, you know, got some extra stuff in it. Um, but we've also, I guess, just taught some uh, general uh, sort of boot camp things uh, with Python, but not a full course. Uh, you've taught. We, we teach a class that yeah. we started last year called Introduction to High Performance Science with Computing, which is kind of a grab bag. We do some parallel computing, OpenMD and MDI. But we start with basic Unix and Python and uh, version control. One thing we've done there that's turned out to work much better than I expected is we use, we force the students to learn version control as the first homework. Mm -hmm. And then all the, all the homeworks have to be turned in by submitting their homework to a, a Bitbucket repository, mm -hmm. which yeah, is Imperial, and then, then we can just clone their repositories to read the homework list. They have to use version control, but they can't. For since in the class, is it just the time now students? Or? No, it's, uh, it's a mix of undergrads and grad students from a uh, fair number from applied math, but quite a few from lots of other departments too. We had about over 100 students the first time we got it, so it was quite a kind of demand that we threw about 65 and stuff. I'm very glad you made the analogy of the time of the hour, but I've made that in the past. Oh, yeah. But can I ask you to read up on the evolution of the Robbins tunnel boring machine? Yeah, absolutely. Really. <laughs> Robbins tunnel boring machine. I was a civil engineer, and as a nine year old, I walked through the Kingsway tunnel that connects the Wirral to Liverpool. You walked through the Queensway tunnel, which was dug by hand. Wow. In the 1930s, but come the 1970s, they had a tunnel boring machine that dug a, a dam in Pakistan. The machine was built in Illinois, and it was digging this tunnel in Britain at the rate of six feet a day. Hmm. It's very impressive technology. In fact, is Andrew here? I was moaning about the, the use of the word tool to him yesterday. It's, a, it's so nebulous as to me, or well, nothing right. rather. You have to distinguish between using a shovel and using some mechanized thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the, the class I should try and teach you bring out. Mm -hmm. you, should, you should find examples for where people are trying to do things by hand and um, things in the world. Yeah. Uh, another thing, just to follow up on the, the, the teaching bit, is um, you know, Fernando uh, has, Perez, my colleagues, has started doing this. And I think it's a really nice thing. So, you know, so, you know giving all the homeworks out in a, in a Git repository for us and uh, having them turn it in. But also, um, you know, the, the specification is a, a test suite. So there's no code that works. There's just a set of tests that fail. And then the, the assignment is to make this test all pass without touching the test, obviously. Um, and, uh, you know, in that sense, it's, you know, comes, uh, you know, a practice where they get to actually learn test-driven development. 
and uh, it makes the specification of the program and whether it's right a lot easier as well. And, um, and also the same thing is just, you know, all uh, submissions have to be done by checking something in and, you know, have a timestamp when it's turned in or not and um, no emails, nothing to deal with there. I'm just curious if that's something as a, a community that's something we should think about is, you know, if we were to think about, you know, how do we move forward, even just teaching students, like, is that, that, could that be a good place where we could start to maybe have some level of, uh, you, you know, uh, unity? Because mm -hmm. so, I know we've talked about it in different types of talks. So. I, I agree completely. And I think, I mean, one thing I would personally want in a course like that is also some, uh, you know, case studies of, uh, you know, sort of disasters in science, right? And we know some of these examples. Yeah, um, and, you know, just trying to figure out exactly, because I think there's some debate about why these things fail and try to figure out what the failure is and what, you know, get people starting to think about failure before they uh, start trying to do success. By the way, for people who weren't here on the, uh, the first day for the tutorials, I think we will be eventually posting our slides on that. Yep. Um, Jared did one on Sphinx, as you mentioned here. Uh, as well as testing, and I did one on gifts, and so, and Victoria did something on intellectual property and basics, and so we'll be posting those slides as well as some links to other things. But Was there really something tomorrow? I can't. Pardon? And the, and the software carpentry uh, course that Greg Wilson developed, unfortunately he couldn't be here, but it's got some very nice uh, short lectures, like, broken into 10 minute chunks that students could watch and then you could, you could assign them given the science based on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's even easy to sort of, uh, what's that? The answer is yes. I think so. Okay. Tomorrow morning. Yeah. So I mean, that maybe is dealing with some more tool stuff as well tomorrow. Um, but I was going to say the other thing with the setting these courses, you guys can, you know, and graduate students can just form a little uh, reading group or something, you know, watch these uh, um, software carpentry episodes and just discuss them. I think would even be a really nice way to start. Yeah, the software carpentry, I, I went through it before, before this uh, started. And, uh, when we were trying to decide what tutorials to run on, on the weekend, or sorry, on Wednesday, and uh, it has wonderful stuff on, um, particularly on the sort of basic tools like version control shell and, and things like that, um, but he never got to the later lectures, and as you point out, there, there's, there are no lectures on things like failure, failures in science because of lack of reproducibility and things like that. And Greg's idea when he, when he worked, was working on that was always that the community would join in. Uh, he told me that version four, which he was working on last year, he had four other people submit something, and three of those people he paid. <laughs> so it, it really was that the, the community didn't jump on board, but it's, the material's all still there, and there's no reason that we, we couldn't get involved. Um, it's just Greg's not doing it full time anymore. Right. So uh, we have five minutes left, but I thought I'd give you guys the chance to get down to the coffee break before everybody. <laughs> <laughs>